much enjoyed being with you guys. Uh, and um, let me know, because I, I guess there's not a microphone here, so let no, me know if my, if my voice drops and you can't hear me, just raise, raise your hand. Sometimes that happens, and I promise I won't call on you. <laughs> <laughs> so, um, as we're getting started here, I, um, let me tell you about a, a little story that I read about two weeks ago. This, uh, this old lady was, was coming to church, and um, one of the ushers saw her coming up to the steps, and so he, he runs down to, to escort her and help her get up the steps and everything, and as he's escorting her into the building, uh, he said, where would you like to sit? And she says, well, I'd like to sit up near the front. And he says, well, I, I, I would kind of recommend that maybe you not want to do that because our pastor is really boring. Oh, and, uh, no. and she says, really? young man, do you know who I am? And he says, no. He says, I'm the pastor's mother. Oh. Oh. And he says, oh, uh, do you know who I am? And she said, no. And he said, good. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, I, I love to joke around. I, I have, uh, I've been teaching at the college level for about 24 years. And, and uh, I always like to have jokes in class and, and everything and keep, keep it lively and, and have a lot of fun. However, as much as I like to joke around, this is a moment in time where I'm not joking. Okay. This is the most serious thing that I can do because I want it to be life-changing for you. I am hoping and praying that someone here tonight, at least one, in the hearing of my voice, where something will trigger inside you that you will be transformed and it will be different for the rest of your life. Now that sounds pretty dramatic, but I believe that that can happen. Yeah. I believe the Holy Spirit can move in power and can tell you something that you needed to hear, can show you something you needed to see, and it could be that it's something that you've heard many times before but all of a sudden, it just, it just hits you, yeah, yeah. and something happens and transforms you. And so I'm hoping that, that something like that will happen uh, tonight. Uh, let me tell you a little bit about my background so you know who I am and where, where I come from. Again, I'm, my, my name is Mike Segallo, and uh, born and raised in the Philadelphia area uh, on the New Jersey side. And um, I, I say that, you know, and there's a, a funny story about a guy who... Uh, I worked with, he tells me this every single time he sees me. And um, he uh, talks about this vacation that he and his family were going on, and they were going on I-70, and I think they were in Indiana somewhere. And they looked over to the side, and there was about 30 feet high uh, barbed wire. And you know, it was, it was a, a penitentiary of some sort and whatever, and the 10-year-old points out the window and he says, oh, Dad, Dad, is that New Jersey? <laughs> so he, he reminds me of that every time he sees it. <laughs> anyway, there are some very good points uh, of New Jersey. And uh, when I grew up there, I, I grew up with parents that, that absolutely loved the Lord. Uh, they taught me from birth to love the Lord. Um, and uh, I had a very, very special relationship with both my parents. And they were just the most wonderful and generous people. And uh, when I was born, I, uh, they tell me that I was two and a half months premature. And at that time, it was not um, not a good thing to be about three pounds. And uh, I think I was in the hospital for about six weeks before they ever brought me home. And uh, my mom said that when she prayed over me, she dedicated me to the Lord. And, uh, and hoped and prayed that I would serve the Lord all my life. And I remember when I was about 10 years old, uh, something dramatic happened. It uh, changed my life, um, or it impacted my life. Uh, I was out with my father. We were, I, like I said, I was about 10 years old, and I was at the point where I was too big now that I didn't need a swing set. 
Okay, because I, I, I was uh, it was I was embarrassed. I said, "Come on, Dad, I'm 10 years old now. I don't need this." So he had uh, he had put this thing in place where I don't. You, you ever see kids when they're when they're swinging and they go so high that the the thing comes out of the ground? Yeah. And that's what I, my, it used to scare my mom to death. And she, she, so she'd say, and my dad's name was Gus, and she'd say, Gussie, you need to fix that. So what he ended up doing was he put concrete around each of the legs to make sure they wouldn't come out. Okay, so he did that years ago, and now here I am 10 years old, and we got to take this thing down. So we were out there with a the shovel and everything, and we had the thing turned over so that there are two of the, the legs are up in the air, and then two are on the ground. And so we're chopping with sledgehammers, trying to chop off the concrete off the leg. And I remember I'm, sit, I'm actually sitting down, and my dad was, was chopping one of the, one of the concrete um, whatever you call, blocks off, and all of a sudden the head of the sledgehammer flew off. Whoa. And it was heading straight toward my head. Whoa. And uh, at that moment, there wasn't any time for me to do anything. But just before it hit me in the head, somehow the swing set kind of shifted, and that other, that other block somehow was, got in the way. I, I can't describe what happened. I don't know what happened. All I know is I saw my dad get up and walk away and he walked into the house and I didn't know what was going on so I kind of followed him and he walked immediately to his bedroom and he knelt down, he didn't know I was there, he knelt down and he started to weep oh. and he started to cry and um, it impacted me so much because I knew how much my dad loved me and he knew that he had just witnessed a miracle and that I would have been killed instantly if I had been hit by that thing and I knew right then that he loved God, that he thanked God, it was okay for a man to cry. I mean, I learned a lot of things from that experience, yeah. Yeah. And, uh, and it really impacted me. And so I lived my life knowing that there was a God. Yeah. I knew that he was powerful. I knew that miracles existed. And when, uh, when I was 17 years old, I made the decision that I was going to serve God uh, for the rest of my life. And, and uh, it was a very important decision of my life. And I became a servant of the Lord Jesus. And so I, uh, I hope that when I share tonight that I'll be able to share some things. Because even though all those experiences have happened, and I've had many, I've, I've, I've seen miracles. Uh, I've had miracles with me as well as miracles of when I laid hands on people. But there was something that happened just this last Sunday, hmm. June 30th, hmm. that impacted me and transformed my life. Hmm. And I even wrote down on my calendar, on my phone, the day my life changed. Wow. Huh. And David called me the very next day and asked me if I would want to preach. Okay. Okay. Coincidence? No. no. I, don't think so. I don't think so. Well, before I tell you what it was, I want to tell you a story. There was, many years ago, a king and, uh, in, a, in a foreign country, and um, he had a servant uh, that had served him for, for maybe 25, 30 years. I don't, I don't know the exact number. Uh, and it was a good, good king. And, and uh, the servant was summoned, and, and uh, he was told that the king wanted to see him in 30 days. And the, uh, the servant was not fearful at all, because the king had always treated him well. He was a really nice king, kindly king. And uh, he had always tried to serve the king as best he could. But as time went on, he began to get a little nervous because he was, you know how your, your mind can, can work on you. He began to wonder if, I wonder if I did something wrong. I wonder, I don't know. And he had this scroll that he kept by his bed that had all the laws and the rules of the kingdom on there. And so he would read it and study it 
And as he would do so, he began to see that there were some areas where he kind of messed up. And he said, oh no, this is what this is all about, I got caught. And he started getting to the point where he was, he was pretty scared about what was going to happen. And uh, then he began to do even more than he did before. I mean, whatever his jobs were, whatever his responsibilities were, he would do almost twice as much because he was trying to earn, and, you know, if he could do, you know, please the king, you know, maybe the king would be lenient on him and maybe the king would forgive him and, and, and whatever. So he, he just kept doing more and more to try to get the king's favor. Well, the day came, and he was to meet the king at noontime. And so he, uh, <clears throat> he was, you know, real nervous, and he was escorted into the king's chamber at the appropriate time. And the king told him, he said, uh, you know, called him by name, and he said, I, I'd like for you to sit down. I, I have a story I want to tell you. <clears throat> and he said, many years ago, our country was at war with another country. And we did not know how long the war was going to last, but we did know that if we had lost the war, the other king was so heartless and cruel that we knew that he would kill anybody in our family. Mm -hmm. Well, we got pregnant and we hid it from the kingdom. We hid it from everybody. And even when the baby was born, we did not tell anybody at all, because we were fearful that, that the baby was going to be killed. <clears throat> so we gave the baby to one of our servants and had her raise him the whole time. Well, we didn't know what was going on. We had a treaty with that country, but we were still fearful that they were going to break the treaty and come in. Well, 30 days ago, that king died, and the threat is gone. So we would now like to announce to the kingdom that we had a baby boy, and you are our son. Wow. You wow. are no longer a servant. You are a son. And you have all the rights, the privileges, the authority, and the power of our kingdom. We're sorry you had to live as a servant all this time, but for the rest of your life, you are our son. Hallelujah. How cool. And so he began to weep. And he said, I thought you were going to punish me for some of the things that I had done, and I wanted to ask for forgiveness. And he said, son, we know what you did. It doesn't matter what you did. Of course you're forgiven. But no matter what you did or do, you are always our son. Oh, yeah. And we love you. Last Sunday, I heard a scripture for the, I don't know, 10,000th time. When the fullness of the time was come, God sent forth his son made of a woman and made under the law to redeem them that was under the law that we might receive the adoption of sons. And because ye are sons, God hath sent forth the spirit of his son unto your hearts, crying, Abba, Father. Wherefore, Thou art no more a servant, but a son. And if a son, then an heir of God through Christ. For the first time in my life, I have always called myself and looked at myself as a servant of the Lord Jesus Christ. I now realize I'm not a servant, I'm his son. You're his son. You know what? That, that, that's transformational. Yeah. That changes everything. Right. Yeah. Because I have the authority yeah. and the power of His name. Yeah. 
And I am hoping, beyond hope, that I can communicate this to you, that you can understand that you are a child of the living God of Israel. And because you have confessed the Lord Jesus, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. you have been adopted and you are a son or a daughter. Mm -hmm. It changes everything. You don't now, and I don't now, have to do things to earn the love or the respect or the favor of our God. Whoa. He's our Father. Amen, amen, amen. He's our Father. Mm -hmm. You get to do things. You don't have to do things. Yeah. I remember when I, when I was growing up, my dad was a, a really good baseball player. And I don't know if you, you guys have been, uh, ever play sports or anything and pretend that you're somebody else, but we would play wiffle ball in my backyard. And whenever we would come up to bat, we would always pretend we were somebody. And, uh, so I, I know some guys would pretend they were Hank Aaron. And, some, and what we would, we would get up there and we would actually go through all the same motions that we'd see on TV and everything. And, um, and there was a guy on the Phillies, uh, Johnny Callison. He was a left-handed batter. And sometimes I would come up and left-handed and I would do exactly what he would do. But there were some times I pretended I was my dad. Because he was my hero. Yeah. And I remember um, one time we had uh, the managers of my little league play the managers of a different little league uh, in a softball game. And my dad came up four times and he hit four home runs. Oh my and, uh, and I remember going around that night, and well, probably for a little while after that, uh, telling people, hey, do you know who my dad is? Yeah. You know who my dad is? My identity was actually from who my dad was. Mm -hmm. I kind of feel the same way now. Now that I fully understand oh, that yeah. transformation, I am now getting my identity from who my dad is. Yeah. Yeah. So I now have the authority and the power, as do you, to speak to demons, to speak to sickness, to speak to the devil. Because there is no weapon formed against us that can, that can prosper. Right. Because we are adopted and we are yeah. the sons and daughters yeah. of the God of Israel. Yeah. I mean, that, you know, for some people that might not be as profound as it was for me, but I'll tell you what, it, it, was, it was dramatic when I saw that. Because as an employee, let, let me think of this, for, for example. Let's say uh, an employee of Donald Trump goes into one of Donald Trump's hotels. And he goes up to the uh, front and he says, hey, I'd like to, I'd like to talk to the manager because uh, I have an issue I need to talk to him about. Uh, you know, they might say, well, you know, he's busy right now. Uh, we've got, you know, we can get you on the schedule. You know, maybe come back next Tuesday. Let's see when he has an open schedule and that kind of thing. But can you imagine if Donald Trump's son walks into the hotel and he says he wants to see the manager? Think that would be a little different? Yeah. Right. yeah, I think the manager would stop whatever he was mm -hmm. doing and he would come and, and so there's a difference. Mm -hmm. Do you think maybe he carries himself a little bit differently than maybe the employee would? Mm -hmm. Of course. Mm -hmm. And that's kind of how we ought to be. That's right. We ought to be bold, Ooh. we ought to be confident, mm -hmm. and we ought to know that we are the son or the daughter of the living God yeah. and sickness. I command you in the name of in Jesus name to get out. Jesus. Demons, I command you out. You, they have to obey you. Yeah. And you, you can be bold about it because you're not an employee. You're not a servant. You are an adopted son or daughter. Okay? So the power and the authority is, is not dependent on how good you are or what you've done. It's who you are. Wow. That's so good. And once you realize your identity and mm -hmm. know that you are God's through Christ, then you have more power than you could have ever imagined. I love it. Luke 9, or 10, 19 says, Behold, I give unto you power to tread on serpents mm -hmm. and scorpions mm -hmm. and over all the power of the enemy, yes. and nothing shall by means hurt you. Mm -hmm. 
does the scripture do? When we realize that, that's Luke 10, 19. When we realize that, it changes everything. Yeah. Now consider for a moment uh, a bushman from the Kalahari Desert in southern Africa. Let's, let's, let's say that he's placed into a dark room. He knows nothing about a light bulb. He knows nothing about electricity. So he just sits there in the dark. Mm -hmm. He doesn't know there's a light switch over there he can just flip on. He has no idea. He could pray. He could pray all he wants for light, but he's got the power. It's already there. He's all he has to do is get. He just doesn't know about it. Uh -huh. Okay. Well, unfortunately, there are many of us who understand electricity, and we know the light switch is there. Mm -hmm. We tend to sit in the dark and still ask God to turn the light on. Wow. When He already gave us the power, yeah. it's just flip it, just on. Turn it on. Yeah. Mm -hmm. But we don't do it. Because we don't know who we are. We don't think we have the authority. We don't realize that we're actually a son or a daughter. And we have the power already given to us. Too, too many times we pray for things God already gave us. It's true. And we have to be bold and we have to understand that we are to exercise that power. So how do we do it? How do we flip that switch? We switch it, I mean we switch it on. Speaking. By speaking, what comes out of our mouth is power. Absolutely. We are made in the image of God, right? Amen. How did He create things? He spoke. He said, "Let there be light." What is it? And there was light. Mm -hmm. So, if we're created in His image, mm -hmm. then we are to create things just like He did, which means we have to speak it speak. into existence. Okay. Now, John 5.19 says, Very truly, I tell you, the Son can do nothing by Himself. He can only do what He sees the Father do. And because whatever the Father does, the Son also does. Mm -hmm. Okay, so if we are a son or a daughter of the Most High God, then we need to do what He did. We need to speak. Yeah. Okay? Now, remember the story of Peter and John when they were walking by the temple? Yes. Uh, at the gate, there was this lame man, and he's asking for alms and everything. And, and Peter, who is an adopted son, just as we are, he says, Silver and gold have I none, but such as I have, give I thee. In the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth, rise up and walk. He didn't pray to God. Jesus. He didn't ask God to heal the guy. He flipped the switch and he used the power he that he already had been given because he was an adopted son. Mm -hmm. He already had the power. We already have the power. Mm -hmm. So when you realize who you are, you'll be able to exercise this kind of power also. You are a son or a daughter. You've been bought and paid for yes. by the Lord Jesus. Hallelujah. You've been given his name, his authority, and the power. So speak and flip that switch. We've often prayed for things that God already gave us. And there's no need to pray for light when you're in that dark room. Just go flip the switch flip on. The switch. There's no need to pray for God uh, for someone to be healed. Go speak. And in the power and the authority that God's already given you, will heal that person. Amen. Now don't get me wrong, I'm not saying don't pray. Of course you want to pray. Yeah. You, you want to have a relationship with Jesus. You, mm -hmm. you want to pray. You want to know His will for your life. You want to get close to Him. You've got to have all of that. And, and if, if you're going to do as the Father does, you need to know what the Father's will is. And so therefore you want to continue to pray. But when it comes to healing and things of that nature, mm -hmm. you just go speaking. You never see in the, in the Scriptures where they go and pray for someone. They lay hands on them yes. and they say, in the name of Jesus, Amen. rise up and walk. Amen. They've got the power. Mm -hmm. So too long, I think, we have been doing things incorrectly. When we'll lay hands on people, we pray to God and ask God to heal that person. Uh -huh. when it, and the power has already been given to you to do it. Speak it. Mark eleven twenty three says, For verily I say unto you, that whosoever shall say unto this mountain, 
be thou removed, mm -hmm. and be thou cast into the sea, and shall not doubt in his heart, but shall believe those things which he saith shall come to pass. Right. He shall have whatever he right. saith. It says say it three times. Mm -hmm. So we have to speak it. And if we are praying, and if we are close to the Lord, then we will not speak things that are not His will. Amen. So once we are close to Him with our prayer life, then we go speak, we exercise that power, and great and marvelous things are going to happen. And God's given us the commandment to heal the sick. Um, sometimes people think that, well, it might not be God's will that a person be healed. You know, maybe they're going through this to teach them a lesson, or maybe, you know, God has allowed this to happen to them, or some sin in their life, or, or whatever. That is not scriptural. No. Jesus healed everyone who came to him. Yeah. Everyone. Right. And it said earlier in the scripture that I read that he only did what the Father's will was. So therefore, it's the Father's will that all be healed. Yeah. So we don't have to ask God, is it his will for someone to be healed? We know that is his will. Mm -hmm. So what we have to do is exercise that power. We lay hands on them. We speak to that mountain. And we command that mountain to be move, cast into yeah, the sea yeah. and remove. Yeah. And we don't have doubt because now we realize if we were a servant, we might have a little doubt. But if we are a son Come or a daughter, on, then. we have no doubt. We've been given the authority because we're a son Amen. or a daughter. Amen. So we, we do that. And then Jesus said in the very last words that he said before he ascended, he said, go into all the world and preach the gospel to every creature. He who believes and is baptized will be saved, but he who does not believe will be condemned. And these are the signs that will follow them that believe. Mm -hmm. In my name they will cast out demons. Mm -hmm. They will speak with new tongues. Yeah. They will take up serpents. And if they drink any deadly, anything deadly, it will by no means hurt them. They will lay hands on the sick, and they will recover. And then he ascended. So the very last thing that he said before he left the earth was they will lay hands on the sick, and they will recover. Hmm. So if that's the last thing that he told us, do you think it was important? Very much so. Yeah, I, I, I think so. Mm -hmm. And uh, in Romans 4.17, it says that we are to call things as they are not, uh -huh. mm -hmm. as though they, they are. are. Mm -hmm. And that goes against everything in our human brain. We, you know, how, how can we say things are different than what we're actually seeing? Right. And that's what God is telling us to do. And this is where it becomes important to go to Isaiah 55, 8 and 9. He says, For my thoughts are not your thoughts, uh -huh. neither are my ways your ways, declares the Lord. As the heavens are higher than the earth, so are my ways higher than your ways, and my thoughts higher, higher than your thoughts. Mm -hmm. So God's telling us to call things that are not as they are. Or to say, we are healed. Exactly when there's absolutely no evidence whatsoever. We're to say we are prosperous and we got stacks of bills all around us. Hmm. And we say to our mind, well, we'd be lying if we say that. It's not true. But God said his ways are not our ways. Mm -hmm. And he said that we have to call it what it's not. There is a... Uh, a thing that I read from uh, a book from Kenneth Hagin, and he said, confession of the promises of God come before the possession of his promises. We have to learn this law if we're going to be successful. And he went on to say, I boldly declare and confess God's word, then 
and only then do I possess the promised blessing or the benefit. If I give the word its place, it takes, and I, I take sides with the word. If I side in, side in with the disease and the pain, then there's no healing. There's none. But I repudiate the disease and the sickness by my words, which are an expression of my faith in God's word. My confession gives me possession. It's good. Faith is covered by our confession. If I say that I have been prayed for and I am waiting for God to heal me, then that's not faith, that I have repudiated my healing. Instead, my confession should be this. The Word declares that I am healed. Mm -hmm. Based on God's Word, I thank the Father for my healing now, not when I see my healing. Amen. And I praise Him. I am healed because according to His Word, it's a fact. Yeah. Yeah. That sounds crazy. Mm -hmm. But something happens in the spiritual world that we don't see. It happens before the physical world. Remember when Jesus cursed the fig tree? Mm -hmm. Now, I'm sure some of his disciples kind of looked at it and thought, I don't know, I wonder, I wonder if he doesn't have the power anymore if he's lost his touch because nothing happened when he cursed that tree. But then later when they came back, they saw that it had withered and died. So the moment Jesus spoke to it, something happened even though they couldn't see it. And that's what happens with us. When we speak with the authority and the power, something is happening even though we don't see it. Okay. Now, um, there's a story of a, of a woman who had a really large mole on her face. It covered almost half, half of her face. And she went to a healing service and they laid hands on her. And so right after that, she proclaimed that she was healed. In fact, she kept telling everybody that she was healed for the next couple of days. And they're like, uh, lady, have you looked in the mirror? Uh, you know, you have not been healed. So, but she continued to proclaim it and, and state, I am healed. Uh, I was yeah. healed by the stripes of Jesus. Yeah. And on the third day, the mole fell off. Hallelujah. And there was absolutely, there was no scar tissue, nothing. It was just perfect, yeah. perfect uh, condition. Now, if she had not proclaimed that, Listen. that may not have happened. Because I know one of the favorite things David always says is that, um, how, how does he say it? God, uh, or we cannot without God, but he won't without us. Some, something like that. For he gives us the power, and he wants us healed, but we have to exercise it by our mouths and what we speak. Yeah. Um, this also leads me to something which I think you really need to understand maybe you do but in case you don't healing is not always instantaneous mm -hmm. there are people who believe that they had hands laid on them and they were <coughs> not healed instantly that God said no mm. and that is not True. Mm -hmm. Now, if they were healed instantly, that would be a miracle. Mm -hmm. But God said, lay hands on the sick and they shall recover. Recover, to me, doesn't mean, or I don't, I don't think it means instantly. It may take some time. Mm -hmm. So, I think we've done a real big disservice to people in the whole Christian world if they think that they have to be healed instantly yeah. or else they're not healed. They are definitely going to be healed hands were laid on them, the scripture and the word says that they shall recover. Now I think that they can undo it by their mouth and what they speak what they say. and Amen. what they believe. Amen. But they have got to have hope and we have got to start telling people that hey, if you weren't healed instantly that night when you had hands laid on, that doesn't mean you weren't healed. Amen. You are healed. Good. And we've got to encourage them. And we've got to let them know that they need to speak it like that lady did for the Amen. three days. Amen. You know, you have to say, I am healed. I am healed. Even though I don't see it, I am healed by the stripes of Jesus. Amen. Okay. Now, um, I had a situation just a few weeks ago where I had a mole that was growing right here on the, on, on the side. Mm -hmm. And it was getting big and it was getting ugly. Mm. And so I prayed to God that he would heal me. And I did that for a little while. And then all of a sudden it hit me, wait a minute. 
what have, what have I been learning? What have I, I'm supposed to not yeah. speak to God yeah. about how big this mall is. Right. I'm supposed to speak to this mall and tell it how big my God is. Okay. Right. That's, right. That's, right. That's good. Yeah. good. And so I began to speak to it. Yeah. I said, in the name of Jesus, yeah. I command you to dry up and die at the root and fall off. Yeah. Now, what do you think happened? The mole dropped off. It got worse. Oh, oh no. no. It got worse. It got bigger. And it got uglier. So what did I do? I began to speak to it even more. I said, you listen. I'm speaking to you. I have the power and the authority of Jesus Christ. And I continue to talk to it. Now, people that are not Christians would think you're a nitwit. I mean, you know, why would you use <laughs> But Jesus spoke to illnesses. Jesus spoke to a tree. And I want to be like my God. Yeah. So, about three weeks ago, I said, okay, tonight, this very night, I command you in the name of Jesus to die and to fall. Oh, cool. I am not going to put up with you any longer. You're, you're legal. My body is the temple of the Holy oh, Spirit. Yeah. I belong to Jesus. You have no right. And I have been uh, adopted into the uh, house of Abraham, or the, the blessings of Abraham, yeah. because I've been redeemed. The I just, I just really let it, ha let it have it. Yeah. And I spoke to it and everything that night. It fell off. It was on. Oh, wow. And uh, and I showed you know I showed my wife before. I, mean, I actually didn't even want to show her because I thought she might get really kind of nervous about it. And so I didn't show her for the longest time. And then finally I did show her and I said you know you think I'd be putting anything on this or whatever. And then I said what I you know I've been praying about it, speaking to it, and, and everything. And and um, so I mean her encouraging words were just continue to speak to it. Amen. Yeah. And. Uh, so then I came back and I showed her, and now it's just completely clear. Nothing, nothing there at all. Glory to God. Oh, yeah. So uh, yeah. God is my witness. My wife is my witness. Yeah. You know that that happened. Yeah. And so I believe what God told us to do. Yeah. Amen. We are to Amen. speak to the mountain. Amen. And it's going to be removed. Yeah. There was another time, I was, and I don't know if it was the same book or a different book, but I, I got on this Kenneth Hagin thing where I, I just discovered who he was and started reading different things. And there, there was a time when he, he said that he was in bed and he started getting some either heart pain or something, some symptoms that were coming on him. And he said what he did was he started laugh. He forced himself to laugh out loud. What? And he spoke out loud and he said, Devil, you can't bring that on me. I won't accept it and get off now in the name of Jesus. And he started and he continued to laugh. And I thought, man, this guy's an, inter an interesting person. <laughs> but he said it did. it did. It left him. Right after I read that, I got a cramp in my right foot <laughs> that, I mean, when you get a cramp, I mean, there's not a whole lot you can do. But, but what I've discovered that when I get one of those, if I get out of bed and I kind of step down and I walk on it, it will go away. Yeah. But because the timing of it was most interesting, I thought, I decided I'm going to be crazy like this guy was. And I, I forced myself to start laughing oh out loud. My goodness. And uh, fortunately, no one was around. <laughs> so I'm laughing. I'm laughing at it. And, I, and I'm not going to, I told myself, I'm not going to get out of the bed. I'm not going to step down on it. I'm going to speak to it and make it go away. And so I started laughing and I said, devil, in the name of Jesus, I command you to take that pain away from me. I know that you're bringing this on me to test my faith. And get out. And I just, and instantly, it, it just as quickly as it came on, it left. And that had never happened to me before. I always had to get out, out of the bed and step down and stretch it out. But it, it was like. Wow, this is this is amazing stuff. Absolutely amazing. And so I would encourage you to begin to watch what you say. Absolutely. Because there's power in what yes. you say. Absolutely. And I also want to caution you that what you say can be used for good and what you say can be used for bad. I have done both. I didn't realize the power of my words. And when I was uh uh 
<coughs> when I was uh, 17, when I gave and when I, when I gave my life to Christ and I said, I want to serve you for the rest of my life, he communicated to me, and I don't know how, how to explain it. it, it was like he talked, he spoke to me, and I felt his voice in me, and I was, this is going to sound crazy, but as a 17-year-old, this is how I was thinking. I thought, if I, if I decide to serve the Lord, how am I ever going to get a girl to date me? I mean, how am I, I mean, the, the, I mean, I, I'm, I'm living out here in New Jersey, and, and I mean, how am I ever going to find a wife? And, and what, a, what a goofy thing to think. But anyway, uh, he told me, I will provide a wife for you. You don't need to worry, and I will confirm to you who you should marry. Amen, that's good. So over the next few years, as I began to date girls, and, and I, I brought a lot of them to church, and I, ha I remember distinctly these... these uh, elders in the church pulled me aside one day and they said Mike you need to make a decision here I mean you know the girls that you were bringing it they're beautiful girls they're lovely girls you know you need to you know if you're getting old enough now you should you should uh, get married and I told them I said well I am going to marry who God says I should marry okay. and I'm going to hold on to that and they kind of thought I was crazy and uh, I, and I had I had numerous people pull me aside and and counsel me, and I kept telling them. It, it, see, I didn't know I didn't know that there was power in what I was saying at the Absolutely. time. Absolutely. But I but I got the results of it, so I just kept saying, "No, I am going to have it confirmed to me who God wants me to marry." And so, any time that I started to get serious with, with that girl, I thought I might like that girl. I would fast and I would pray. And on one particular occasion. I decided it was a Wednesday afternoon, and I, I believe it was in August, and I decided I was going to fast lunchtime. And so I, I drove to this park, and I sat under this tree. I still remember sitting there. And I began to pray. And I said, Lord, is this the girl you want me to have? And, uh, and her, na her name was Peggy. And I didn't get any kind of an answer. I mean, it was just nothing. Yeah, I don't know if you've ever mm -hmm. felt like your, your mm -hmm. prayers didn't even reach the ceiling. I mean, mm -hmm. I, it was like nothing. So, I, you know, I packed up and went, went back to work and everything. And then the very next Wednesday, I decided to do the same thing. And this time, I sat on the same tree. This time, not only did I not get a yes, but I got an uneasiness feeling. Ooh. I mean, it was, it was just a real nervous, uneasy, something's wrong feeling. Okay. Now, I should have known from the first experience or the second experience, but I kind of really like this girl. So uh, I decided the third week I would do the same thing. Third Wednesday, I'm sitting under this tree, and this time a blackness comes over me that, that was unmistakable. Something was wrong. And I thought, oh, gee, you know. What am I going to do now? We'd never even have to fight. I don't even, how, what, how am I going to tell her? And so I, I, I had a piece of paper and I said, I got to write my thoughts out. So God, I mean, maybe I'll write her a letter, figure out what I want to say. And so I wrote this letter, you know, th th about why we needed to break up and this and that. And, and I, I got done, I folded it, put it in my pocket, went back to work. And that night, uh, I was at home with, well, I had a townhouse with two other guys, and three of us shared a townhouse. And I'm in the kitchen doing the dishes. And I hear the doorbell ring, and one of my roommates answers the door, and he says, yeah, come on in, Mike's in the kitchen. So this guy comes in, and he walks into the kitchen, and he says, Mike? And I said, uh, yeah, uh, have we met before? I don't, I don't remember ever meeting you. And he says, no, we haven't met, but I came to talk to you about Peggy. And he said, can we, can we walk outside? It's kind of private. And I said, yeah, sure. So. We go out there, and he proceeds to tell me that I have been dating his wife for the last nine years, oh, nine months. Nine years. Wow. What? Wow. I quickly whip this letter out of my pocket. I don't know if this guy's going to shoot me or what he's going to do. I mean, I, I, I already told him, hey, you know, I already decided I'm breaking up with him. You know, like, you know, <laughs> and he said, no, you know, hey, don't worry about it. I, you know, I was able to track your phone number down, and I don't. He, he explained how he found me, and he said, "Hey, we are headed for a divorce, but I just wanted to come and tell you about her." 
And he said, how, how old did she tell you she was? And I said, 21. She goes, no, she's 28. Oh, and then he proceeded wow. to tell me all these things. Like every single thing she ever told me was a lie. Wow. And, um, and all I could do was, thank you, Lord. Because can you, you imagine are. had I not had that experience Man. with the Lord, and I was still in love with her, and I still thought we were, how, how devastated I would have been. But, but because the Lord was gracious enough to yes. let me know, and I had that letter, and I never yes. did see that person again, ever. I never ran into her, and I, I mean, Amen. just vanished off the face Hallelujah. of the earth. Wow. And um, so anyway, that, so I, I'm still going to trust God. Must. Now, two years later, now I meet, this, I, I meet this girl. Oh, no, let me even tell you before I met her. On a Wednesday night, I'm sitting at prayer service with about 13 other people. And we're sitting in a circle. And this, I'm 24 years old, 23, 24. And um, mm. this lady stands up and she points right at me. And she says, thus saith the Lord, you are not going to have to look for a wife. He is going to bring her to you. Mm. And she sits down. And I go... Me? <laughs> so, so this is a Wednesday. All right. Now, on the very next Sunday, the very next Sunday, my wife comes to the church. All right. Wow. Now, of course, I don't know if she's going to be my wife, but, but uh, you know, really beautiful girl, and and, and uh, people introduced me to her and everything. Of course, I got her name and phone number, and, and uh, then. Uh, our very first date was actually going to church, uh, and um, so anyway, I start to fall in love with her, and, and um, I'm going to do it again. There's no way, even though I love her, I would love to marry her. I am not going to unless the That's Lord says it. yes. Amen. So I decided on a Wednesday again. I don't know why I picked Wednesday, but I, I decided I was going to fast all this day on Wednesday. And now, I don't know if any of you have experienced this, once teenager or once people get out of college, sometimes they go out and live on their own, and then they come back to mom and dad. Well, anyway, I was back with mom. And then one, one, of the guys, one of the guys got married, and we didn't want to pay his rent, so I ended up, I'm living back with my parents now. So about 10 o'clock at night, I, I, went, oh, I went, to, went to church that night, and I, I thought somebody was going to stand up and say, Mike, you're supposed to marry Dawn. But nobody did. So, because I, and I'm not telling anybody. I'm not telling anybody that I'm fasting that yeah. nobody knows. Yeah. So this is going to have to be from the Lord. So about 10 o'clock at night, the phone rings. And it's, the, it's our pastor. And he calls to talk to my mom. And I said, well, actually, my mom went to bed. She always stayed up late, but for some reason she went to bed early that night. And then he says... Well, we started talking about the Phillies, and he's a real sports fan, just like me. And then all of a sudden, his tone changes. Mm. And he says, Mike, I need to tell you something. And I'm like, you know, I'm on high alert at this point, because I've been fasting all day, and I'm, I'm wondering if he's going to say something about Dawn. And he says, well, I had a spiritual dream, and mm. I've only had two of these in my entire life. And he went to, to explain to me why this was a spiritual dream and how he knew it was. And he said there were two things that happened in this dream. One was that you had asked Dawn to marry you. And it was very soon after you guys had started dating. And the second thing was the most powerful thing I've experienced is that God was very pleased. Wow. wow. Mm -hmm. You know, tears, tears started going down my... And I said... You know, why are you telling me this now? He says, I have no idea. He said, what I thought would happen was I figured you guys would probably get married, and then maybe a year down the road, if you were running into problems, I could always share this testimony with you. I actually never intended to tell you this before, because I didn't want to influence you or anything. Right. And then I told him, I said, well, let me tell you that I've been fasting this very day for this very thing, and that is why God prompted you to tell me that. Wow. Yeah. So... Here I was speaking to all those people that told me that I was a fool. Mm -hmm. And I said, no, I'm not. I'm listening to God and I'm going to speak it. And I kept speaking it and speaking it and speaking it. I didn't know the power of words. Yeah, of course. But that's, that's what happened. That's so yeah. Now, I didn't always speak 
positive things. Well, let me think, well, there's one other thing I did when I was in high school. I was in high school and college, this, was, this, this is kind of goofy, but I'll, I'll share it with you anyway. That, just to show you how there was power in words, yes. I, there was a, an intersection that there was a highway that would go this way, and there's no light. So you, you go up to this thing, and you have to wait and wait Come on and now. wait to get on before you can, you know, you had to make a, you could never make a line, <coughs> but you, had, you still would have to wait a long time. But it was always open for me whenever I got there. And I used to tell everybody that, hey, you know, when I get up here, watch this. You know, there's not going to be any traffic when I get there. I know you and I would it. speak it all the time. And my friends would go crazy because they always had to stop. And, yeah. they, and it got to the point where it got to be such a joke. They said, hey, Sigala, let him drive because it, it always opens up for him. But, I, you know, I spoke it. And I don't know, you know, maybe because I spoke it, it happened. I, I really don't know. But I've also experienced the other. Back in 2001, my business failed and went down. And since that time, I have been in sales. And some weird things happened a couple of times where right near the end of the, just before the sale would close, something fell through. I began to tell everybody. I mean, I, I think of this now, and I'm thinking, oh, geez, Mike, you know, every time that I get a deal, it goes all the way right near the end, and then something always falls through. Mm -hmm. How many times have I told that to people? And guess what? It, it happened. <laughs> and I'm thinking to myself, you know, if I had learned some of this stuff 10, 11 years ago, I gotta keep yeah. my mouth zipped yeah. and, and not spoken what I see, but I have to speak what I want to create yes. and the power that God's given me instead of speaking speaking those things. Absolutely. Another area, every <coughs> single time I come to a red light, it turns red. <laughs> <laughs> you know how many times have I said that, Andrew? Like four hundred million times in your lifetime? Oh, what happens? It turns red. <laughs> Okay, so I got to zip it, and I've got to realize, you know, because I'm I'm not just preaching to you. I mean, I'm preaching to me because these are things that I'm finding out that I'm sharing with you. These are laws that God has put. He has said that you are my son or my daughter. I have adopted you. I have given you power, and what you speak will come into existence. So speak what is my will. Amen. That's what we have to do. Amen. That's good. Okay. Um, <coughs> let's see. When we are born again, we have a new spirit and we're new creatures in Christ. We've heard that before. Mm -hmm. And I wrote, some, I wrote this down, and I thought this was pretty profound. I think the Holy Spirit gave this to me. It said, the old man would call things as they are. Mm -hmm. The new man calls things as they are not. Uh -huh. The old man speaks to God and tells him how big the problem is. The new man speaks to the problem and tells it, how big God is. Amen. Yes. The old man would ask God to heal someone if it is his will. The new man speaks to the illness, the demon, or the body and commands it because of the power and the authority that he's been given. Mm -hmm. The old man views God as his master and therefore he sees himself as a servant. Mm -hmm. The new man sees God as his father yeah. and therefore sees himself as a son. Mm. The old man will thank God after he sees his blessing. The new man will thank God after he asks before he sees his blessing. Mm. Hallelujah. Mm. And so these are the things that, that I am going to speak in the morning when I wake up and I would challenge you to do the same. Mm. Mm. Speak these things out loud. I can do all things yeah. through Christ. 
because of what Jesus has done. Yeah. I have been adopted, and I am a son of the Lord God of Israel. Mm. My heavenly Father strengthens me. Mm. I cannot be conquered, and I cannot be defeated. I will fulfill my destiny. No weapon formed against me yes. can prosper. I use my words to describe, I do not use my words to describe my situation, but to change my situation. Amen. I call things that are not as though they already are. Yes. I am surrounded with the favor of God as with a shield. Yes. I have favor before God and man. Great and marvelous things are happening to and for me. Yes. And because of this, I am a blessing to others. Yeah. Yeah. Father, lead me and direct me in all that you want me to do and say today. Yeah. Close doors that no man can open, yeah. and open doors that no man can close. Yeah. Cause me to be in the right place at the right time, yeah. and may the Holy Spirit give me utterance. Yeah. Guard my mouth yeah. so that I will only speak your will, yeah. and yeah. thank you for all of your blessings. Yeah. Amen. 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 And if we Amen. say that every morning, I think we're going to see some neat things happen. Yes. Because all of the blessings that God has given you are not for you. Right. They are for you to share yes. and to bring others. Because we have a message of hope that this world needs to hear. Yes. Because if you can tell them that all of their past is washed away, you are free, you are set free, you are a son Jesus. or a daughter the Most High God, mm -hmm. He will remember your sins no more, mm -hmm. and you have the power and the authority to act on His behalf. Amen. What greater message of hope is there? Awesome. There is one. So I hope and pray that as you heard these words, that something will happen in your heart, that you will know that God wants you to know for sure that He has adopted you. And you're his son or daughter. That's good. That's good.